So, cats. This is Casper. He's a cat, if you haven't noticed. Cats have a long, long relationship to this planet, going back millions of years, and a very long and sometimes roller coastery relationship with humans over tens of thousands of years. I know, it's amazing. And at some point in the timeline, we got Casper sitting right here on this table with me, giving me little headbutts. Like I said, a long story, and that's what we're gonna get into today. One of the things I tell everybody who listens to me, it is the basis of my whole philosophy, is that if you wanna know Casper, if you wanna know the cat that's sitting with you right now, then you have to understand cat with a capital C. I mean, their history with us has been laced with mystery. The part of cats that we don't understand is the wild part, and that has made them subject to deification and demonization over the years as well. Because what humans don't understand, we tend to either really bring close to us in love or the mystery causes us to demonize them. And that's part of the relationship. As a matter of fact, if you take a look at my tattoos, this is a tour of the mystery right here. I mean, we've got the Japanese demon cat up here. We've got the regal cat over here. We've got my cat right here. This is Valoria turning into a little fish cat. And this tattoo, which I feel really uh, embodies the mystery. This is from a, a 19th century Japanese artist called Kubayashi. And Kubayashi made this into a woodcut. Now, if you look at this from afar, what do you see? You see a mask, a, a, almost a demon, something scary meant to drive you away. But as you zoom in here, you will see that this is all made of cute little fluffy cats. In fact, the nose right here is a little cat butt. And that is the mystery right there. An animal that pulls you in and at the same time might drive you away. Before we get back into this, just a, a plea to you guys who are watching this video. A lot of you who watch this are not subscribed. You might even think you are, but you're not. So do me a favor, hit that subscribe button. Also, don't forget to ring the bell so that you hear all about the stuff that we're doing and give us a like because, you know, we all work pretty hard on this thing. So 6.2 million years ago, the genus Felis was born and separates the lineage from other small animals. Now, of course, there's a couple million years that go by, but I think that's what's really important is if you think about 130,000 years ago, the Near Eastern wildcat is the most populous of cats concentrated in the Fertile Crescent. And that Near Eastern wildcat, here's the most incredible thing. A 2009 genetic study showed that all of our cats, whether it's Casper, all cats, are descended from that Near Eastern wildcat. That is crucially important because it shows you this straight line from who I call the raw cat, that Near Eastern wildcat, to Casper right here. A very straight line, so that's pretty crucial. One of the things that made the species feel us so wildly successful was that as they evolved, they evolved to be one of nature's most perfect hunters. This is what sets the stage for that human-animal, mutually beneficial relationship that defines the cat journey through time. Now here's another really important milestone. About 12,000 years ago, we see proof of the first grain stores that, that humans had, which is to say, that's our transition away from just going out there hunting and eating what we hunt, but to actually store food. What happens then is that there's a high concentration of rodents because the rodents eat the grain. Rodents eat the grain, they poop in the grain. The poop gets in us and we get very hyper sick. So what then happens is the cats, that Near Eastern wildcat, that we've been talking about, that cat starts to concentrate too because that's where their prey is. They say, don't worry about it, humans, we got it. And they then prey on the rodents that were eating our food. And suddenly what happens? The birth 12,000 years ago of the mutually beneficial human-cat relationship. Generation upon generation, as these cats make their homes in the towns with these humans, they become just a little more domesticated. They, they become more of a part of the human life. And that's where the genus Felis catus comes about, right around this time, because we can't call them tame, but we really can't call them wild anymore. As a matter of fact, there was this trio of cat gods in Egypt, Maftet, Bashtet, and Sekhmet. 
and those three represent justice, fertility, and power. In the Battle of Perseum, the king of Persia said, you know what, we'll use this against them, painting the image of their beloved goddess Bashtet on the shields of his soldiers, and knowing that the Egyptians would never strike that shield because they didn't want to offend their goddess Bashtet. That war turned into a rout, turning on that battle, because basically the Egyptians laid down their arms and scattered, not wanting to strike the image of their goddess. But that at least shows you how the Egyptians revered cats, and that's important. But what's equally important is it was not all about royalty and deification. There was also a bond being formed between human and animal. It, it was about love. The recent discovery shows a 2,000-year-old, basically a pet cemetery. And in this pet cemetery, there were cats and dogs, and they weren't mummified or highly adorned or anything like that. They were buried with care and love. And here's the love part. Their remains show that they were elderly, and they were a lot of them were physically handicapped, couldn't get along on their own. So the burial of these animals and, and having this sort of reverential place to put them shows that we were caring for them because they couldn't get along without us, and they had become part of our hearts and homes. So that's a really significant discovery. Hey, if you want to know more about the history of cats, because Casper clearly wants to, then pick up a copy of my book, Total Cat Mojo. You can buy it at jacksongalaxy.com or any place that you buy books. And by the way, anywhere you are on the planet, maybe, probably not, you can probably get a translation of Total Cat Mojo or any of my books. Uh, here we have Polish and here's Portuguese, also Korean, Japanese, Chinese, Hungarian, Turkish, and a lot of others. So check that out as well, because I'd love for you to learn more about the history of cats. Now, of course, with all good things and all new discoveries in these burgeoning cultures, cats were known to do their jobs incredibly well and very efficiently. And of course, food was being stored all around the civilized world at that point. And whether they were the Phoenician merchants uh, dropping off cats around the Mediterranean or the Romans taking them into the Roman Empire, which of course expanded greatly, it was all about the cats doing their job and protecting food stores and ridding these societies of rodents, which were really threatening uh, health and well-being and these food stores. In fact, by about 300 AD, we see evidence of cats in Japan. We see them spreading in Northern Europe like crazy. We saw evidence of cats in Viking ports around this time as well. So it really was a rapid expansion. And again, if you think about how these societies were building, whether it was food and how we store food and what kinds of food were being traded and and clothing and just all types of goods cats were also a commodity let's face it they were on these boats to protect sailors and to protect their stores they get to where they're going and they're like hey have a few of these too because they really work but here's the difference as opposed to food as opposed to clothing and leather goods and cotton and whatever else cats were a living breathing commodity so not only did they do their job but everywhere they went they made a lot of friends <laughs> Now, in most societies, we're going to see evidence of cats everywhere from uh, Japanese artifacts to the, the wreckage of Pompeii. We see mentions of cats throughout history. As a matter of fact, in the Canterbury Tales by Chaucer in 1380, we see the mention of a cat door, which of course means there was cats, and there were cats in homes too, so that's one thing. As cats started to make these friends and do their job over time, it was inevitable because of that mystery that I've talked about where cats can be revered, they can also be reviled. Finding that midpoint with cats over history has been pretty hard. And as we get into the Middle Ages, uh, we start to see some problems emerge. Celtic mythology refers to a cat named Sit or Sit. And that cat was a black fairy with a white spot on his chest. And it was told that he could steal human souls or shift human form nine times. Of course, 
That's probably where the whole nine lives thing comes in. Aha. Uh -huh. But anyway, you, the, you see evidence of cats being associated with Satan, especially among black cats, that they are Satan's tool, that they're representative of Satan. And that's bad news for the cats. Cats were blamed for the spread of the plague, and they were rounded up and killed. And really, uh, the, the extermination was the goal. And of course, that didn't happen. But it, they tried. They definitely tried. And the ironic thing is that it wasn't the cats who were causing the plague. It was particularly fleas that rode on rodents, and some cats, of course, as well. But with the extermination or near extermination of cats, the rats took over. And cats, at that point, start to be associated also with witchcraft. The more they represent Satan, the, the more they are associated with people who were persecuted as witches. And you got to think about the rise of global adventurers and explorers, which we start to see in, in the 1400s. Wherever they landed, cats did too. In fact, 1620, that's the voyage of the Mayflower, there is evidence that there were cats on the Mayflower. They came to the new country along with the pilgrims and settled here with them doing their job, making sure that with the, the burgeoning farms and, and the things that allowed these pilgrims to survive in those rough first years, cats helped. Now these cats who have found homes in the new country here in the United States, um, they flourished for a while. But just as we saw in Europe, there was the perpetuation of cats, especially black cats, as being representations of Satan. Anybody who studied American history probably knows about the Salem witch trials in the 1690s. This is sort of a culmination where we see the fear of witchcraft just just absorb everybody in the quote-unquote new world. And unfortunately, black cats, still associated with Satan and satanic rituals, also burned at the stake along with suspected witches. In fact, black cats barely came away uh, without being extinct. So how did cats go from being burned at the stake to sitting in your lap. That change happened very quickly, very dramatically, and led to what has been an ongoing renaissance of cats. And I'm gonna talk about all of that in the next episode of The History of Cats, so please stay tuned. Also, please let me know anything that I've missed here in the comments. Don't forget, subscribe to this channel, hit that bell so you hear all about what's coming up next, and I will see you next time with part two of The History of Cats. All light, all all love, all cat mojo to you. Meow.